So, by now I have seen the first three episodes of Arcane four times. And I did it for one simple reason. I wanted to cover every single hidden detail in this series. And let me tell you, there are a lot of details hidden all over the place. So, it will be impossible for me to catch absolutely everything. And so, if you notice something I didn't, let me know in the comments. Of course, this video will contain spoilers. So, go and watch the series before you head back here. But now, without further ado, get ready to jump all over the place as we cover all the interesting details found in Arcane's Act 1. At the beginning, Jinx is singing about a dear friend across the river. This is the River Pilt, which is going right through the city, with Zon mainly occupying one side and Pilt over the other. This is further hinted when the notes of this song start to play when the shot reveals Pilt over. We then see a civil war. All we know is that one day the Zonites tried to march onto Piltover. Later we will see that this place got a memorial for these events. You can notice that young Vi wears a necklace with a gem. She does not wear it later on. During this civil war her parents died. But Jinx wasn't crying. Revealing that either Jinx has some kind of other trauma or because she didn't share the same feelings because Jinx and Vi are not blood related sisters. Jinx said one day she would ride one of the airships. In the Get Jinxed music video she shoots it down. Later during the parkour section. Of course there are cupcakes on the balcony. These cupcakes are the favorite snack of the Kiraman family. Which is Caitlyn's family. That's why she's using cupcakes in her traps. It is revealed that the lab they break into belongs to Jace. And the reason why there were cupcakes there is because the Kiraman family were Jace's patrons. So even though he was in their workshop, it was still his lab. You can notice that there are magic runes drawn on the blackboard. That's because he was trying to figure out how magic works related to the hex crystals. Jinx mentions that the music box may be a real Valdiani, but we have no idea who that is. The horse she finds in Jace's lab is from Jinx's music video. Also, Jace has a nose hair trimmer. That may be a problem for Jace. Then it is revealed that Vi got a tip for this place from Little Man, who is later revealed to be Echo in Benzo's shop. We can also find a withered flower in the lab, because Jace just didn't have the time to take care of it. Also, Jace can play a lute guitar. Jinx then found Jace's favorite sandwich, which Riot actually sold during Arcane's promotion. The wall clock in the back references the Old Hungry, which is a nickname for the main watchtower in Piltover and Zone. While Jinx's eyes are grey in the entire series, after opening the Hextech lockbox, her eyes reflect blue for the first time. Notice that the main characters have their eyes grey, because their character hasn't fully developed yet. The color of the eyes is a big thing in this series. The box reveals 6 hex crystals, with 6 slots left empty. You can hear the singing voice of the Brekkern when Jinx picks up the crystal. You can hear it more intensely right before it explodes, killing an entire generation of the Brekkern stored inside. During their escape, they run past Zindelo's Incognium Runeterra, one of the most iconic landmarks in Piltover. After they get ambushed, in the docks you may notice a pentakill logo on the wall. It is covered with a puff cap. Next to it there is an injured on an airship poster, featuring Corporate Mundo. And between them there is an ad for the last drop. Jinx threw the hex crystals into the water, which coincidentally may be where Silco's base is. I wonder if those hex crystals will be discovered in the future. She jinxes every job, he said it, during their venturing to Zone. There is a homeless Yordle on the right, despite Yordles being able to live in Bandle City. The guy on the left carries a greenhouse on his back. In Zone, people often build greenhouses to get some fresh air from the trees, but rarely are they mobile. We can also see some masked Ionians with hats. These may be related to a counselor later on, but they don't necessarily have to be. They seem massive here, but that's the perspective of the kids. In the background you can see that they are just as tall as normal humans. There is a store with Krug and puff caps. I swear to god, this guy who was dragged into the whorehouse has to be a reference to a real person. They kinda stand out from the rest. Also, her. The guy was later thrown out without his pants. Once again, I have no idea who this is. In the bar you can see that the local currency are bronze cogs which were referenced many times in past stories. Vander is called the Hound of the Underground, 
maybe hinting at the fact that Vander could actually be Warwick. The two guys to his opposite are traders. They seem to have bilgewatery and tattoos. And the woman even has a Serpent Isles accent. In the background of the hideout there is seemingly a picture of Vander with the kids. There is also a blue vest hanging above them with the flag of Milo's face. One of the kids can play a saxophone. Since it is a bunker bed shared with Jinx, I assume the top bed belongs to Vi. There is a plushy fish on the couch, a possible inspiration for future fish bones. Jinx finds metal jaws in the trash, foreshadowing chompers. Benzo's shop has an insane amount of items in the background, so it is very easy to miss things here. But I notice that there is Trindamir's helmet above the entrance, Benzo is inspecting Heart of Gold, and there is a really cheap looking Rabadon's death cap. When mentioning that enemies can also be on their side, Vander touches his wrist. Later it is revealed that's where he got a cut from Silco during an earlier civil war. Echo's ring runner is parked in front of the shop. Little man or Echo revealed he knew about the valuables in the lab because apparently a guy walked into the shop and bought all bunch of items with gold. So Echo followed him home. This means that Jace went shopping into Benzo's shop. The reason why the Wardens wear masks is because the air in Zone is incredibly polluted. If you don't live in Zone, you are not used to it. And everything smells like a dumpster to you. In the back there is a suspicious owl-like mask. But also Leandri's Torment and a mask that is very close to Akali's Blood Moon mask. Definitely related to Ionia. But some people thought this was Jin's mask. Nope, that's definitely not the case. But right below them there is also the old remnant of the Ascended. In the next scene, Jinx said her inventions never work. And Vi replies, they will. This was the last time she mentioned it. Need I say more? I know it's not an easter egg, but how does a pipe function as a telescope? The final scene of Vi and Jinx in this episode mimics their first scene. Silco's hideout has Bilgewaterian sea monsters outside. Perhaps to keep people from looking for it. Looking at the creatures in the jars, yes, the purple chemicals may be related to the void. Hilariously enough, the purple eye from the original trailer belongs to the rat. And yes, Twitch has purple eyes. Yes, the rat can be him. Moving on to episode 2. At the beginning, Jace talks about his shopping in Zone. You can see the exact same items Milo threw into the bag. So Milo technically stole things from Benzo's shop. In Jace's flashback, the hex crystal the mage used to teleport them to safety is the same one he gave him after it was depleted. And yes, Jace's journal, which you can find in the game, revealed that it is a small hex crystal and that hex crystals can be depleted. Despite the mage being a mystery, they wear what seems to be Targonian clothing. During the teleportation, you first see the planet to indicate that they are shifting in place, but the spell activates when the moon crosses over it. That's because Runeterra's moon has a deep and complicated connection to the magic realm. If you are interested in that, Aphelios' story explains it well. The moon stops right over Piltover, so that could be roughly where they were teleported. Jace's mother has a frostbite on two of her fingers. Remember that. Later, Heimerding reveals that he is 307 years old. Not only did this reveal that during the early days people weren't afraid of yordles, and so he didn't have to use glamour to hide, but also the rune wars happened more than 900 years ago. So he shouldn't be able to remember those events. However, we know that in Bandle City, which is the home of yordles, time moves at a different pace. So it is possible for Heimerdinger to only be 307 years old, but also remember the Rune Wars at the same time. It's funny to see Vi punching Milo, even though he's not a bad guy. What a misdirection this was in the trailers. On the scoreboard, the only one who was able to compete with Vi was Clagger. They use Bilgewater themed guns because the entire game is themed around Bilgewater. The game seems to be powered up by Chemtech. The targets actually have numbers on them if you hit them. Jinx then leaves to play a Teemo themed arcade. After the lights go off, not only are the tags around them very reminiscent of Jinx's theme when she grows up, meaning that this place may be responsible for making her mentally snap. But also at the shooting game, you can find a massive chomper. 
In Mel's introduction scene, her assistant reveals that she became rich because of the inventions of Clan Pharaohs. The Pharaohs family are not only the ones who first started harvesting the hex crystals, but they also became rich because of intimidation and assassination. Yes, Camille is from House Pharaohs. So if Clan Pharaohs decides to threaten Mel, that might become an issue. Mel also sneakily revealed that there is a difference between a clan and a house. A house is smaller. So while now the Pharaoh's family is a clan, in the past they were but a house. The assistant also reveals that Jace's house, the Tullis family, became known for their collapsible pocket wrench. This is a reference to the fact that Jace is inventing transforming tools for the working class. This includes his future hammer. Caitlyn's mother seems to be a native Piltoven. Her father seems to be Ionian. You can see her holding a rifle in the family photo, foreshadowing her future. Back in Zone, there is this guy with a really long top hat. I think he might return because there was a similar character in the original reveal trailer. Silco's sidekick is in Vander's pub. After they disagree with Vander, a few more leave. This shot with the samurai poster on the side was used in the anime music video. This counselor is interesting. Here we see Mel giving him a present, which is followed up by the other counselor trying to do the same. We know that Mel is Medarda, and we know that the Medarda clan uses crimson, red and gold coloring. So it is highly likely that all three of these are from the Medarda clan, the most powerful clan in Piltover. And the reason why the other Medarda would give him presents is because this may be young Jago Medarda the one who ends up leading the clan in the future. How he gets to that position with his childish character, I don't know. The voice starting the trial was Caitlyn's mother, Mrs. Kiraman. You can also find her father in the crowd. This counselor reveals that his race was nearly destroyed by magic. We don't know what kind of a race he is, but he looks very similar to the Keeper of Masks. Interestingly enough, before speaking he has to fire up the device on his face teasing that perhaps it is translating his words. Before it starts translating, his voice is actually similar to the two Ionians from the beginning. Also, the subtitles reveal that his name is Bobok. Heimerdinger then remembers the Rune Wars. Once again, even though he is younger than the Wars, it is possible. The other counselor then reveals that, just like Demacia, Piltover 2 was founded to escape the mages. When his mother, Zymena, speaks out, you can see that she has two augmented fingers. They were taken by the frostbite. House Talis has a lot of stones on the table. From Jace's journal, we learned that these are likely the minerals related to magic. Sudarian, Gumangium and Targonite. There is a picture of Jace and his father with the Talis hammer, revealing that his father likely died. When Victor browses Jace's journal, he finds the same arcane runes he had on the blackboard. Back in Silco's underwater base, you can see the moving tentacles of a kraken in the background. When the professor in the base speaks, the subtitles reveal that it is in fact singed. Right before the blonde boy drinks the purple chemical, everything goes silent. Once again revealing that it may be related to the void. Under Jinx's bed there is a sprayed over rhino foreshadowing how Jinx wreaked mayhem in the zoo in the music video. Later, Vander refuses to fight, and Vi told him that if he won't, she will. Vander replied that he had that kind of talk before. He is most likely referencing his conflict with Silco. In Vi's final talk with Vander, they stand at a memorial, which was built on the bridge from the very beginning of the series. It was built in the memory of those events. When Vi looks at the memorial, you can hear the faint melody of the song about the river Pilt. Victor revealed that he was a poor cripple from the Undercity. This is interesting because in Jace's journal, he wanted to ask Victor about what house he came from. Well, Victor didn't come from a Piltoven house after all. The shot of Jinx sitting at the bar perfectly mimics the shot with the monkey in the music video. Vander was actually going to let Vi get captured. But after he saw how depressed Jinx was, he changed the plan. In the very last scene, there is an Avarosen shield behind Vi at Benzos. And this takes us to episode 3. After the massacre, when Silco paid Marcus, he paid with gold cocks instead of the bronze ones. That's why they look different, they don't have the hole in the middle. 
Also, the cogs got tainted by blood, indicating that it is all blood money. Every time the blonde boy appears on camera, you can hear otherworldly voices. Once again, hinting void. Victor talks about not dampening the oscillators when dealing with Hextech. Jace references the exact same thing in his journal. Jace also suggests to crank it, foreshadowing Victor's future creation, Blitzcrank. The next scene in Zone seems to be sneakily preparing us for war. They are crafting numerous weapons and they have an incredible amount of the purple chemicals ready. The purple chemicals are being pumped through a living, breathing organism. Once again, this has to be related to the Void. Vander reveals that Silco was perhaps the leader of the lanes in Zaun before him, and the two share the same vision. Silco called him a lapdog, once again hinting at him being Warwick. Silco then reveals the purple chemical is called Shimmer. Also, Silco called Vander brother, but we are not sure if they are blood related. Back in Piltover. Literally every key on Heimerdinger's keychain leads to his lab. The place has four keyholes. Before Vi left to save Vander, she gave Jinx a torchlight. She told her to light it up wherever she was, and Vi would find her. You bet Jinx is going to use it when they get older to bait Vi out. Jace's machine to control Hextech is surrounded by runes. That's because in his journal, Jace theorized that these runic letters are related to the arcane. Before the mechanism was fired up, once again, Victor got ready to crank it. In Jinx's packed suitcase, you can see the rabbit has its ear signed by Violet, foreshadowing Vi's name reveal. There is also a picture of what I believe to be Vander surrounded with hearts and wings referencing Jinx's Star Guardian skin. Later, you can see that the drawing really was Vander and the kids. And there is also a drawing of Fishbones, her future rocket launcher. During Jace's experiment, it seems like they were able to briefly rewind time. I wonder if that's somehow related to Echo later on. When Silco's gank is revealed, you can see the woman from Vander's pub. Vi's first proper punch of the series may be a reference to her encounter with Urgot during Warriors. Once again, Omnia's voice is whispering when Shimmer appears. Back in the lab, when Jace and Victor manage to get the crystal working, you can see it drawing out runes. After the magic erupted and the stars were revealed, you can see how all the magic lines relate to the moon. Once again, the moon is heavily tied to the magic on Runeterra. But I don't think this was actually drawn by the crystal. I think it's a painting on the ceiling itself. And back in the finale, the monkey's head was nailed back in place because she ripped it off during her breakdown. Whenever Clagger is in frame, you can see the shot has a fuzzy filter over it. That's how Clagger saw the world through the goggles during those stressful times. Jinx got the idea to use her monkey as the detonator during her mental breakdown. Also, the in-game ward suddenly makes so much more sense. And finally... It worked, just like Vi told her the last time. Which also means, yeah, those bits from the enemy music video were a pretty good misdirection. It's all lies. Before the explosion goes off, you can hear an insect-like sound. That's the breaker. During the explosion, you can see the woman that sacrificed herself for Silco lost her arm. The shimmer supplies were destroyed. Singed's face got singed. But I don't think he's supposed to be wearing the bandages just yet. That should come after Warwick scars him. Despite everything going down the drain, Jinx is actually happy her invention worked. Before Marcus noticed the explosion in the distance, he was holding the blood money, thinking about his lost mentor. During that scene, you can perfectly hear the Brecken scream in the background. To fight, Vander ripped off the meat hooks that were hanging above him. In the flashbacks, Silco cut Vander's arm. Also, they are fighting in the waters, probably near the bridge where the civil war happened. Remember this shot. Vander's growling is very similar to Warwick's. Also, he briefly howls. During his final scene, when affected by Shimmer, Vander's eye is purple. When he dies, it turns grey. Did you remember the shot? Vice and Powder's encounter perfectly mimics Vander's and Silco's. Also, Vi called her a Jinx here. Vi checks her hand, remembering that Vander told her that bruised knuckles wasn't the way to solve her problems. 
Jinx calls her Violet, as was signed on the rabbit. When Silco returns, the woman is still alive, with burned arm. And finally, God damn it, Riot, you got me well. And that were all the details found in Act 1 of Arcane. As you can see, this show is full of it. It is insane. But again, I'm pretty sure there is more. It is really hard to notice everything. So if you found something I didn't, let me know below. And with that, let's take a break for 3 days. Before we get to do round 2 and we go back to this again.